So you, you heard that. Um, if we've still got questions at 2 o'clock, we'll finish, it, we'll finish outside. outside. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, now switch over. English. British English, not even American English. I'm a Brit. You can tell from the accent, huh? Can't help it. Anyway, thank you for being here and sharing just under two hours with me. Um, and uh, we're going to today go through a whole bunch of tips and tricks to help you get published. Because if you've done the research and you haven't got published, it never happened. That's a sad reality. Uh, I'm sort of partly in the way of the screen. I can't do much about that because of various things and so on. We'll see. Okay. Um, first quick question. Who here has published a paper already? Okay. Uh, and have you published more than 10? More than 50? More? Okay. 50, okay. It gets easier, they tell me. Um, who's trying to publish a paper now? Yeah, okay. Just in time. Good, it's cool. If you have published a paper before or tried the process, it's called peer review, it is odd. People you thought were nice suddenly turn on you and are vicious. It's called peer review. That's what it seems like. Hmm? Pardon? You can't hear me. Is it this better? You now tethered me to the spot for, for two hours. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. I got this is for that and that's for that. Whatever. We'll see. Yeah. I've had worse. Okay. Good. Is that okay? You good now? Cool. All right. So, peer review. It seems like you're trying to get your paper accepted and there's a whole bunch of people get in the way called the referees. And they turn hostile. You know, the clubs and guns and chainsaws and, and the Grim Reaper. Um, it's not like that. It just seems that way. So we've got to work out how can you deal with these people and get your paper accepted. Peer review is the way forward. If you don't have peer review, then you really, uh, your paper doesn't have the same validation. That's the whole process. Lots of things we'll talk about today. Some things we'll just skip through because, in effect, we have a two-hour window. Uh, we had a few traffic problems getting here. Apparently, that's what Israel's about. Um, and uh, so, one hour, 50 minutes, it's a two-and-a-half-hour talk. So I'm going to skim over some things and slip a few things. The whole slide set, you will get. It's been recorded, but you also get the whole slide set in about a day, day and a half, as a PDF. If you're really keen, you can write down 110 pages. Your choice. I wouldn't bother. Here's what we're going to be talking about. I can't move. There's a microphone. Hopefully you read, read around me. Okay. Lots of articles growing, lots of journals coming in. Typically, 3%, 4% more articles a year because it's 3 to 4% more scientists per year. Uh, and there are round about 28,000 peer reviewed journals, and that's generating 1.8 million articles a year. So, you guys and all the researchers out there in the whole wide world, 1.8 million articles a year. 2,000 publishing houses, tiny ones publishing a single uh, hardback journal a year, all the way up to big ones like the Wileys, the Springers, uh, the, the Elseviers, and so on. <coughs> Every serious publishing house has a, a publishing cycle. It happens to be Elsevier tree here. It could be anyone, really. Uh, but serious publishing. And there are a few weird ones out there. But let's say you get the papers in. The editors do a desk reject, a triage of a whole bunch of stuff that should never have been sent in. Uh, and then it, the ones that they I think are good, they go out for peer review. Those ones come back in, not accepted ones, get edited, prepared. They get uh, produced, put online uh, in print, if there's a print version. And then when it's up there, they're seen and downloaded and used and cited. And then people then send their papers in. So that's the whole cycle. Um, and so with our journal editors, I'm sure it's similar with other publishing houses, typically 
30 to 60% desk reject, not good enough to send out for peer review. How can we get you to be not that group? That's what we're talking about today, tips and tricks. It gets sent out to two or three reviewers, depending on the journal. So we typically are using about half a million reviewers a year. A third of a million articles accepted. Joins the other ones online in Science Direct. And it's the same thing so with Springer Link and so on. And that gives you a lot of downloads, a lot of exposure to your article. And then people then use it, cite it, and so on. We really change from print all the way through to electronic. So basically everything now is electronic. Uh, so think as an author, electronic. How can I make my article look good online? How can I make it with hypertext links? How can I do perhaps interactive figures? Whatever, all the things that make your knowledge, your data, your information easier to absorb by the reader are the handy things. So if you don't publish it, it never happened. If you don't publish it and go somewhere else, you could perhaps go to a, a conference and, and present a, a talk or uh, do a poster, but it's not the same as publishing an article because that's up forever in the record of science. It's, it's a permanent record. It's not a, a transient thing like a conference. Uh, you might have a personal reason for publishing, uh, getting a PhD, uh, funding, uh, promotion, whatever. It's, the basic idea is you've really got to have it published. The, the mechanism of valuation of scientists is citations of publications. So if you're not publishing, not getting downloaded, not getting read, and not getting cited, you're not in that loop. And you need to have that for funding, for uh, permanent tenure, and so on. Once it has been published, it's assumed by everyone that it's, it's OK. It's real. It's good. All right, there are a few dodgy papers out there. It's not that many. It's about three in 10,000. Um, and the, uh, the rest are all OK to use, as they are. And that's what we do. We see articles in peer-reviewed journals, peer-reviewed books, and we assume, OK, that's good to use. So um, what we're doing uh, is providing this platform. That's what we all do. We go look, we grab things, we use the data. No one reads peer-reviewed journals for fun. Come off it, you know. We do it because it makes our work better, more effective. Uh, if you do read your peer-reviewed journals for fun, you need a different social life, is all I can say. <laughs> Why are you going to publish? Again, to get it out there, to get it seen, to get downloaded, to get cited. What are you going to publish? You're going to publish new material, original results, a good new method, wonderful. Or review, it's a, a summary of what's going on in the field, which you've actually somehow pulled together as some sort of uh, synthesis of what's going on. A critical review is important, whereby you actually add your input in there as well, not just your skills uh, to gather together and praise articles. And of course, manuscripts should advance uh, the field by uh, a reasonable amount per time. They shouldn't be, well, you could do Me Too papers, but to put in things like PLOS One and Helion, it's better to actually put those real advancing papers out there. I need to have some water, so I have to, I'm not connected, it's good. So I'll just get some water before I... Sorry about that. Back to the tether, back to the microphone. So you're not going to be publishing things that are not scientific. <coughs> that is for bl what blogs are for. And you're not going to be publishing out-of-date work, because that's why publish something out-of-date, when in effect what you've got is, is something out there is, is eclipsed to you, it's too late, publish something else. Anything you publish before, that's enough. You don't do it a second time. They can find it out there, it's online. You don't do it a second time. Otherwise, it's called self-plagiarism. And it should be correct. It shouldn't be inaccurate or inconclusive. You need a strong manuscript. Science is collaborative, but the but is we're competing for real estate in journals. You've actually got to have a strong, effective paper out there. You've actually got to have good content. And the good content is to share what you've found out there in a good, clear way an exciting way. Scientists in general, we're not exciting. We're pretty boring. OK, but we can get good science, and we're excited by that and pass it on in an exciting way. And of course, the presentation has to be good and clear and logical. 
you've got good presentation and not much content, what a waste. If you've got great data and you're not presenting it well, it's also a waste. It's the combination you need to get out there. So many articles written are so badly done that it drives editors-in-chief crazy with the poor quality and all the junk they've got to reject the whole time. So a good, strong manuscript, well-written, well-put-together, well-spelt, good figures, is a joy for them to read. And so it tends to be easier to go through out into the peer review system. <laughs> You've still got to deal with all the comments of the referees, but at least it doesn't get stopped at the first hurdle. It doesn't get stopped as a desk reject. So what's a strong manuscript? Useful, clear, exciting, of course. It mustn't be all over the place. It has to be a very logical line. Many people think they should write it almost like a diary. We did that experiment, that experiment, that experiment. That's, not, that's the chronological way. You've got to do it in the logical way. Here's the problem, here's what we did, here's what we found, here's what you think is going on. What do you think? That's that logical line running through the whole manuscript is important. It makes it easier to, to actually to process. And of course, uh, you want it to get out there to be seen by people, so it actually has to be, be seen first by the editor-in-chief and then pass that triage or not, desk reject, goes out for peer review, gets looked at, worked on, improved, and then it finally gets published. But what you've got to do as an author, you've really got to focus on the, the significance. We're not used to doing that. We tend to be very implicit in our language, spoken and written. You imply this, you imply that. And you might be saying, oh yeah, well that figure, is that, that graph's a bit different, and, and, you know, and I mentioned it in the figure legend, that's not enough, that's too implicit. You've got to be explicit. No, here is what we may have found, here's what we think's going on. That explicitness is very, very important to make your paper stand out for its novelty of what you've discovered. It first goes to an editor who's a very busy person. Most editors work full-time as scientists. A very tiny number, of course, the entire industry, are full-time employees of publishing houses. And these people are busy, they're teaching, they're researching, they're writing papers, they're writing grant proposals, and they're getting papers coming in and deciding which ones to junk and which ones to send out for peer review. So make it easy for them. They send it out to referees, typically two or three, and with those referees then are really looking at that. They're also busy people. And then so therefore make it easy for them. What you may not be thinking about is as an author, you've got to think about the reader all the time, not you, them. And you've got to think also, let's say, interaction. You and the referee, you and the editor. That's the interaction going on later on, you and the reader. It's a people game. So you've really got to be very aware of this. It's not just the words. It's actually how you interact with people during this peer review process. And of course, before you even get there, you've got to think about what's happening. Have you done your research? Has it been done before? You might have walked into a lab and they said, hey, here's your research project. Oh, thanks. Um, but here's what we've done before. And so here's what you think should be OK to, to start doing. Fine. Check it out. It might be that someone's just published that in Christchurch, New Zealand. You haven't noticed. So therefore, you've got to really do your research to make sure that what these things have actually not been published yet. When you do all your research to see what has been published, what hasn't been published, you're looking for the gaps, gap analysis. And also, particularly in your own department, what's been published before, what did they say the next experiments should be? Is that what you're doing? Fine. Does it make sense? OK but save your search profile in Scopus so that whenever someone publishes an article in that particular field, you get an email alert so you're up to date without going looking for it. Don't use Google. Google's fine for finding pizza restaurants or whatever. You've actually got to use serious search engines to find these things. This happens to be a screenshot from Scopus. You can use your, your keywords, see what's been published. You get information about the top people, uh, the, the top... Uh, institutes, the countries, the keywords, all sorts of different things you can find out. You can find highly cited papers, you can read them through, you can filter. There's all sorts of useful information out there provided for you by the university and you're probably not using it enough. 
It's, I call it strategic information gathering. This little red checklist is to remind me to tell you uh, there will be also a checklist of various things to do as part of the data we share with you uh, in a day or so's time. So become skilled at this. Just as when you first started, you were, you were taught to use a centrifuge or taught to use uh, a microscope or whatever, you need to know how to use search engines. You need to know how to find the right information and understand it. Because once you've got that, it doesn't go away. When you and the people in your lab are actually together working on something, then you are thinking, OK, well, this is your project. You're the first author. Other people are helping you. They're co-authors. And they're working on their projects. And you're helping them. So they're the first author, and you're the co-author, and so on. So that, that's fine. So you ask yourself as a group, is it OK? Do we know what we're doing is right? Do we know it's, it's new, it's interesting? Is there a problem we can solve? Is it a hot topic? These are all questions you're asking. You're doing the experiments. You think, OK, this is this and this and this. Do we think this is enough of a story, or do we need to do another experiment? That extra experiment is what you're talking about, this extra little bit. Um, and when you think you've done enough, enough to tell a coherent, logical story, that's when you start thinking, OK, we're there. Do not keep on saying, I can do one more paper, I can do one more experiment. I can do yeah, that's years of work. The idea is, what's the minimum amount of information you need to do to write a reasonable sort of paper. Once you've got yes to all the answers, you're good. Full article, short article, depends. Not much data, short article. Case report, short article. Amazing discovery. You want to get out there quick and basically grab as intellectual property, short article. Uh, and then later on, a full article with all the rest of the information. But typically, the full article is the, the normal, the norm. Uh, what's that? 12, 15, 20 pages, depends on the topic area. Uh, and, and that's what you're going to be pulling together. There are also sorts of new things you can do, like micro articles, a couple of pages, or just a, a methods um, improvement, just a very simple thing like methods X. Uh, you can publish your data uh, as a separate thing altogether, as data in brief or in Mendeley data. So there's all these various components, the so-called research elements, which were not around a few years ago. And it's our job as publishing houses to think of these extra things to help you guys find information you need and also uh, share it better. If you're not sure whether to do a short paper or a long paper or whatever, talk amongst yourselves, talk to senior people in, in the department uh, and just see what they think. Uh, and then you think, OK, we're pretty good. We know what to do now. Do you start writing the paper at that point? No, not quite, almost, but not quite. Because if you start writing now and start writing a whole lovely draft manuscript, and there it is, you're very happy, you then look for a journal to put it into, and you find the great, perfect journal. What happens if that great, perfect journal has a word limit and you just have exceeded it tremendously? What a waste of your effort. Do you actually shrink it all back, or do you find another journal, plan B? What do you do? So it's best to actually work out where you're going to submit it first. There is some research just published that some major labs are actually working out where they want to publish before they even, they even start the research project. They can structure it in such a way it will give results that are easy to publish in something like Nature or Cell or whatever. So it's very interesting. This is a whole new thing just, just happening now. But to find the right journal, you've got to be thinking, what does the reader want to see. Not you, the author. What does the reader want to see? And will they be happy when they see it? Um, we all have a sort of a comfort zone of journals. If you see articles in certain journals, you think, OK, that's, that's, that's good. That's what I expect to see it. You might see a great article, judging from the title, in some search engine, and it's, it's a strange journal. OK, so right, you go look, and it's interesting article, but why do they put it there? It's that hesitancy you don't want the reader to have. You want them to feel very, very comfortable. They found your wonderful article in a journal they would expect to find it in. That's the mindset you've got to be thinking about. And you and your co-authors have got to come up with a bunch of candidate journals and then evaluate them and decide which one you're going to go with. And that candidate journal, you look at your references, you say, OK, well, right, there's we're going to be citing 10 papers from this journal, so that's a, a candidate journal. And one of your co-authors said, well, I just published in this journal, and they're nice people, they're very helpful peer review. Well, OK, that's another possible candidate. 
And you go, go through and you're adding up all these various candidate journals. Eventually, you're trimming it down to, to five. Is the journal peer-reviewed to the right level? Is it aggressive, hostile peer review like nature or, or science, whereby they're 99% rejection and they always want to do extra experiments which cost a fortune in time and money? Or is it almost no peer review whereby they just look at it and say, oh, yeah, it's fine. That's not helpful. You want to have some serious, honest suggestions to make your article better. And that's the sort of level of peer review you're after. Uh, and, and how about the journal's audience? Who, who are they? Are they actually people who uh, will read your work? How do you know? We don't know who the audience is. So you assume if they've published in that topic area in that journal, there's also a reader there. So if you can find articles in that journal on your topic area, it's good. It's a good candidate journal. If you've only got, say, 5 or 10% of that journal has stuff on your area, Perhaps go for another one that's got more, say 20 or 30% on that topic area. Again, to increase the chance of people wanting to read your article, download it, cite it, and so on. How, um, how fast is a journal? Is it important? In a perfect world, no. In reality, yes. Uh, if you want to uh, cite your work, it has to be published. If you want to use it in a grant application, it has to be published. If you want to apply for another postdoc place somewhere else, published. If you want to get your PhD, it has to be published. So basically, you've got to publish as fast as you can. And also, of course, you're competing with other people. So first to publish gets the fame. Those who publish afterwards don't. And so how do you know if a journal publishes quickly? Some journal tells you, some don't. Um, in a perfect world, again, everyone would say exactly what was going on. Some, some libraries actually keep track of publication times of journals. So you can actually just check it out very easily. You go online to that particular journal or that publishing house, look at the journal, volume, what's the cover date, take a few articles, say, okay, this, this is the submission date, uh, the revision date, the accept date, that gives me my, my timeline. You've got an idea of those particular articles, a few articles of that journal, and that gives you a feel for that <laughs> journal. Check the other candidate journals and see what they are. You might be surprised at the range. Some journals are really, really quick. They are, from start to finish, seven weeks. Some can be 11 months, everything in between. Uh, and so it also varies, of course, from field to field. Social sciences tend to take longer to publish uh, than, say, life sciences. Uh, in my journals, which are applied biochemistry, from start to finish, in other words, submission to online, then the average for my journals has to be maximum of, of 13 weeks. If it's less than 13 weeks, I'm okay. If it's more than 13 weeks, I complain to the editors, can they actually do something to speed up the refereeing process? So it's important. And if you do publish after someone else, but you submitted before them, and it is intellectual property, like patentable, then you can patent it because you were first to submit. But to the outside world, if someone published first, then that's the, they're the people who got there first. But in law, technically, you can get the patent. It's a gray area. Impact metrics, impact factor, SNP, site score, and so on. Uh, do you need to publish, want to publish open access? If you do, great, fine. There's lots of good open access journals, but there's less of them than there are subscription journals. Of all the journals out there, that's 20 odd thousand, 85% um, are subscription journals and 15% are open access. So it does narrow you, yourself down a bit. There's lots of hybrid journals whereby they, they do either subscription or they take open access if need be. If you are publishing open access, make sure it's a real journal, make sure it's not a fake one. There are fake journals out there, so-called predatory open access journals, not good, uh, easily foolable people send in their paper and their money to these journals um, and then they get uh, yeah, ripped off. Unfortunately, journals' names cannot be copyrighted, they can only be trademarked, that's international law. So you can have, a, say, a journal of biological chemistry, good, strong American journal, and for a while, published out of Pakistan, was the Journal of Biological Chemistry. Fake. And they pulled the plug after a couple of years. Anyone who actually published there, gone. 
Uh, so you've got to be very careful that it's not a dodgy journal. So if you do have a list of these candidate journals, make sure it's not on, say, the Beale list or some other blacklist. If it is, cross it off and find another one. You're looking for up to five potential journals. Look at the aims and scope. Make sure that the, the scope hasn't changed a bit since you last looked at the journal. These things can change. It might be that the journal had all these things as a scope. They decided not to have that and to add these things. They're moving slightly. If your topic is that and you send your paper in, it's a very quick response. It's called an out-of-scope reject. What a waste of your efforts. So always look at the aims and scope to make sure it still reflects what you want it to do. Take your journal article in its journal. Different sorts of articles. Some journals only take short papers. Some don't take short papers. Uh, some don't take reviews unless they're invited. Some love hypothesis papers. Some hate them. And so they'll tell you very clearly uh, what they want. So just give it to them, basically. Bibliometrics, as I said, there's a whole bunch of things out there. Impact factor, site score, and so on. Another way to find out more information about the journal. So what you're going to try to do, you're trying to find these up to five candidate journals. And with that, you're trying to then say, OK, we think we, this is the right bunch. It's the right community. It's the right group. And what we do have just, just launched is um, an updated version of our journal finder. If you tried it in the past, uh, before July, I apologize. It was awful. Um, we changed it tremendously uh, by throwing a lot of money and AI at it, uh, and that works very well. You put in your abstract of your potential article, a few keywords, and see what it suggests. It does only suggest Elsevier titles, I'm sorry, which are, what, just 2,000 or 20,000 out there. But at least it gives you an idea of possibilities. So that's a, a useful thing. So it's, uh, to me, I'm pleased we made up for the... Uh, the inferior product we used to offer people earlier. And then you and your co-authors are all, all happy because you've decided there's a few particular journals on your shortlist. Then there comes the fun. You've then got to decide between you in a nice, pleasant, social way what's the first one you're going to go for, journal A. And you work down this cascade. You're not going to say we've got journal A to E. Let's send it to all five at once. It's, it's a fast-track way of doing things. It's called parallel submission. It's unethical. It gets, if you get caught, very easy to get caught. You've lied. And many journals will ban you for two years for doing this. So it's not worthwhile doing it. So once you and your co-authors agree on the, the journals, the sequence, A, B, C, D, E, you then think, OK, it's journal A. Hopefully, we'll never need to go to journal B. Journal A is enough, you hope. So, what do you do? You look at the guide to authors of Journal A. And if that's the point you find out it has word limits, you think, please, I didn't write a long paper first. And so, then you use this guide to authors to help you. The guide to authors is actually to help you help yourself, because in a perfect world, we'd have one guide to authors for everything. It doesn't work that way. Every editor-in-chief wants to make some fine-tuning. Bit here, bit there, bit somewhere else. And then some of them are really wedded to their guide to authors, and so some are a bit laid back. You don't know who is a bit twitchy and who isn't a bit twitchy. That's the reality. So the guide to authors you're getting, you find it somewhere, and you, you can actually then download it. If you can have a print version, maybe, if it's more than three months old, I suggest you tend not to use it and use the online version, because we, it always changes a bit here and there. <coughs> Here's what someone said a while back, a guy called Paul Haddad, editor of Journal Chromatography. He sums up what most editors say. Too many times people are sending papers out of scope. They haven't bothered to read the scope of the journal. They didn't use the guide to authors, which he carefully fine-tuned to make it easier for, for authors to present their papers in a good way. They didn't suggest good reviewers. They, uh, 
reviewers' comments were responded to appropriately. Uh, the English quality was substandard. And it has had some cases where people had a rejected paper, they left it in their drawer for a few months, changed the title around, changed around the co-authors a bit, and sent it in hoping you wouldn't notice. Of course he noticed. And he gets upset by that and then tells them to go away and not come back for two years. Uh, publishing houses do not ban authors, editors do. So if they do want to ban you, they can ban you for a certain period. It's never a lifetime ban. Um, we always recommend, if asked, one year, two years, three years. Uh, but two years seems to be the standard across, across most journals if they are determined that they don't want to see you for a while. Two years, two years is a short period, but it's, it's long enough. Here's another editor. He is the editor from a journal, Protein Expression and Purification, one of my editors. You read that. It's... Uh, bit scary. What he's saying is, being American, he doesn't want garbage. He wants to see interesting stuff. He wants to understand what's going on. If he can't make sense of what you are trying to get at, he's not even going to try putting it out to peer review. It was a desk reject. If he finds more than six grammatical errors in your abstract, it's a desk reject. You might think, oh, I was going to fix Polish it all up on the revised version, you don't get the chance. It's a desk reject, as simple as that. So always send it in as if it's the final, final, great polished version, the one that's going to be up there forever. It might just be. But at the same time, always have this viewpoint in your mind. You're sending in the best possible content you can to a journal as a submission. When you're writing, you might be English first language, English second language. No one is taught to write scientific English. If you do English either as an English person or as, as a non-English speaking person, you do English literature. English literature is longer. Typically the sentences are 50% longer. It doesn't help. Short, snappy sentences. You've got to write as clearly as you can, objectively, be accurate and be brief. That's the challenge, being brief. You've got to think about your sentence construction. Again, short, snappy sentences. Your tenses are important to tenses. It's subconsciously the reader reads tenses and understands more from it. So you talk about uh, the introduction, you talk about uh, what's happened at the moment, you know, the current situation, present tense, past papers, it's past tense, of course. Uh, you describe your research experiment, past tense and the results you've got. You discuss them, present tense, your conclusion is present tense and future tense. That's the normal process you think about that. And often people just don't think about the, the subtleties that we absorb from reading well-written sentences. That's the extra signaling we're getting, sort of the second signal, underlying signal in, in each sentence. The grammar has to be absolutely correct. If you're not sure, get, get a polishing service or get someone who speaks you know, native English and get them to polish it for you. And that, that's you know, really important. I know the quality of English has gone down and down and down because of things like emails and so on uh, and WhatsApp. But at the same time, you still have a certain basic level of communication. If the referees cannot understand what you're trying to say, they're not going to try. Simple as that. Of course, English. You might be bilingual, trilingual. You've got to write in English. Fifty years ago, you could actually publish in English or German or French or Russian as long as you made the abstract in all four languages. But those times have changed. Now, for most research, it's English. Well, some research is published in local language. For example, law or poetry, literature, and so on. For science, English. Perhaps in 50 years, it'll be Chinese. Who knows? We probably won't be around then. Yeah. Well, you will be, I won't be. So, Read the guide to authors. The guide to authors is very, very clear. It says you should write in American spelling or British spelling, not a combination. That's the normal way of saying it. So if you're the first author, make sure everyone uses the same spell checker. And don't say, no, Microsoft made me do it. Right click, change it to a default dictionary to another one, US or UK or whatever. Very easy. Uh, some journals even say you must use British spelling or you must use American spelling. That's rare, it does happen. And uh, if you're not sure whether to use American spelling or, or British spelling, any ideas which one is best? 
You're biased because you're hearing me speaking. <laughs> it's actually American. We lost. The Brits lost. Sorry. If you check up scientific words in Google Scholar, it's a seven to one ratio of American spelling to British spelling. So we definitely lost in spades. Um, so you want the reader to be comfortable reading. So if it's a seven to one ratio, that means that seven eighths of the audience out there reading your article will be happier if they can read it in American spelling. Just to let you know. You can choose. If you're sending it into a journal that's based in Britain with a British editorial board, you might want to check what articles they're accepting if they're in American or British spelling and decide accordingly. It's a people game. But just be aware that the, most people out there are wanting to see the text in American, sadly. That's the way it goes. I can't help that. Just moan the fact that uh, it happened. As I said, scientific language, short, snappy sentences. Read it out loud. If you pause for breath, it's too long. Simple as that. That's a simple, simple test. Of course, if you fall over, then definitely it's, it's too long. Now, when you're actually doing your research with all your various co-researchers, you can consider them all co-authors. And that's probably the case most of the time, but not always. Who's an author? Ah, yeah. It varies. What's, it started off with the Vancouver Group rules, which is the medical journals, and spread out into life science, physical sciences, engineering, and so on. And an author has to contribute substantially to the concept design, data acquisition, analysis, and be involved in drafting the article, and involved in final version approval. Uh, and at the same time, be accountable for what's in there. Uh, so that's also important because they were very concerned, uh, the Vancouver group, uh, that people were publishing papers that couldn't be replicated. And so that's what they, this came in. Now, if you have someone, say, like a, a, a lab tech helping you with data acquisition, uh, do you want to add her as a, as a co-author? If it's just data acquisition, not really, because she has to be involved also with some interpretation of, of what's going on. So you need to involve her in some discussion about what this data means, and you can add her as a co-author. Otherwise, she becomes what's called an acknowledged individual. So that's all sort of the process. Also, if someone really polishes your very, very bad, bad, bad first draft into something sensible with good English, that's not a good enough to, be, to demand to be a co-author. They can be there as an acknowledged individual helping polishing the manuscript. There's certain rules, and we'd like it to be maintained if possible. How do you work out who's the first author? Normally, of course, it's the person who did most of the work. Except physics is different. Physics is alphabetical. It's easy. All the way through. But normally, the first author is the lead author who's done most of the work. Make sure everyone uses the right spell checker. Make sure they all get all the things in time. <laughs> discusses things with them. So that's the lead person for that particular project, that particular paper. First author. They often are the person that submits it as well. Does that make them the corresponding author? No, corresponding is an old-fashioned term for the senior author. Some publishing houses call it corresponding, some call it senior. You can have more than one first author. You can have a co-first author. It does happen occasionally, about one paper in 200. Uh, and a little asterisk at the top and down below in the footnote, it says, please note these two authors contributed equally to this paper. See, it happens. Uh, for the senior author, it's the, it's normally it's the person who's the PI or the, uh, the professor, the head of the uh, department or whatever, the one who actually is looking after, supervising all the research happening in that lab. Uh, and that's the, say, the senior author. You shouldn't have ghost authors. A ghost author is not the paranormal. A ghost author is someone who you forgot to include who should have been there. How can you forget a co-author? Pretty easy, apparently. I get an email a month from saying, hey, I should have been a co-author. And we, we use a special protocol. It's called the, uh, the Committee on Publication Ethics Protocol. So we contact all of the co-authors and say, this person says she should have been a co-author. And nine times out of ten, the answer we get back is, oops, we forgot her. Typically, it's someone who was there at the beginning of an experiment and moved to another university, uh, a long experiment, year and a half or so, writing it all up, forgot her. 
Then you look idiots, because what happens is you then have to publish a corrigendum which says uh, the authors would like to apologise that this author should have been there in the middle of the, the group uh, and apologise for any confusion this might have caused. In other words, we're idiots. So always reach out to these people and say, hey, we're finally pulling this experiment together to write it up. Yes, we got there in the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you involve her with all the various discussions of the draft and the polishing and so on. A small point protocol, when her name's up there, there's an asterisk, now at University of X. You don't list her university out there because that's not where the work was done. That's all. So that's how you stop having ghost authors. Gift authors is the reverse, where people get added because they demand to be added, like, I polished your paper, add me, or uh, it's, it's my grant money, or something. So that's, no, that's not right. And it's, it's abused in some countries more than others, sadly. Uh, for looking at things out there as well, you've got other sort of trends you can look at, you've got to be aware of what's out there. It's too easy to get head down looking busy in your, in your research and not noticing what's out there. You've got to literally have one eye out there and one eye down here to see what's going on the whole time. And um, we're going to have Max here just uh, talk a few slides and I'll hand over the, uh, the other microphone. Yeah. Well, you just clip that on, it'll be fine. All right. Off you go. Thank you. Oh, it's not easy. Alone. Oh, all right, I did it. That one's not there. That's the oh. one you. Got. Oh yeah, all right. You got to stand there. There, all right. Hello. <laughs> I'm not going to suffer alone. Uh. Hi, this is Max. My role in the company is giving Anthony a break during the presentation. <laughs> it's an hard work, sometimes dirty work. But somebody has to do it. <laughs> now, Elsevier is a publisher is one of the most important publisher, uh, but also an analytics company. So I'm working with data. And I'm showing you some slides about your institution, because we, Anthony talked a lot about collaboration, how to find the right topic to do research, to publish, how to find, um, how to understand who are your readers and so on. Um, and, but it's very hard to find collaborations if you don't know who you are, uh, where you as institution or team you are publishing and so on. So analytics can help. And, and you have access to the, to the platforms uh, like Scopus. So you, you can get a lot of information from uh, databases, uh, from data. So as you can see, uh, Tel Aviv University, scholarly output, is a very strong scholarly output, a lot of documents. If you look just to the number of documents, you are very strong in medicine. Um, yeah, medicine, then I checked this also. Physics and astronomy, biochemistry, mathematics. Uh, a number of authors uh, is in increasing. And you have a very, very strong field weighted citation impact, uh, the metric here. 1.71. This is a metric to compare uh, articles and documents in the same field in the same time frame. So one is the average and 1.71 uh, means that you are stronger than the average. Uh, but if you look at some performance indicators uh, in the last three or four years, you can see the outputs in top citation percentile is above the, the average here, 16.4. But look at the international collaboration. Can you see the international collaboration? Yeah, you are a little bit um, below the average. And you will see how much is important <coughs> to collaborate with the other international institutions, other, other researchers in other countries. Also, if you see the, the publication in top journal percentiles, uh, yeah, you are on average and same, a little bit above the average for the academic and corporate collaboration. Why to collaborate with uh, other international institutions is so important? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't think you can read the slide. You will see this uh, later when we share the document. But international collaboration uh, the field weighted statistician impact is 
57. Uh, only national collaboration, the field weight sedation impact is 0 0.95, so this means a little bit below the average. And when you collaborate with institutional uh, authors and other people in the same institution, is a little bit um, above the average. So this means that when you collaborate with other international uh, researchers and other institutions, the result and the impact of your research is stronger. It's really stronger than all the other publications. And also, if you look at the most cited article from the Tel Aviv University, it's published on The Lancet and is very, very, very important. It's, uh, it's based on a very strong collaboration. You can find lots of different uh, researchers from, uh, from uh, a lot of different institutions. So this is really important. Um, you can find all the information on Scopus. Uh, you can use Scopus to analyze documents, to see the macro trends, to check for uh, other publications, to see what are the really important and hot topics at the moment. Do you know the topics on uh, Scopus? Someone had... Hmm? On Scopus. It's, it's available on Scopus. Um, the, topic, the topic you can see is a way, is a new way to classify uh, publications. Because as Scopus, as all the other databases, we start from uh, a classification based on the, on the decision of the journal to stay into a specific subject field. So the publishers say to Scopus, we are publishing in medicine and we get this information. But if you look at the publication and the correlation between all the publication through the citations, we can create clusters and we can create this kind of topics. Topics are research questions. So if you share a research questions with other people, you can find collaborators, you can improve your, uh, your collaboration with the others. And if you look at one article on Scopus, you can find immediately below the abstract the topic prominence. So you can see the topic. In this case, this, will, this is plastic, marine pollution, and microplastic particles. But you can see uh, the most important documents for this topic. And you can see the most important, the top authors. And also in the cloud here, you can see which ones are the, the, the keywords who are growing, the importance. Uh, and which one the, war, uh, the ones who are decreasing the importance into the topic. So this is something very important and very useful if you want to get more information from the database. Um, about uh, comparing journals or choosing the best, the candidate journals for your publication, for sure impact factor can be one of the metrics to, to look at. Uh, here you can see you know, the, the number of citations through all the, uh, and the time after publication. So you can see the peak of the, public, the, of the citation is after three, three years. Um, one of the issues of uh, the impact factor is that it is uh, influenced by uh, different subject areas. So you cannot compare papers in neuroscience, for instance, with papers in mathematics because the... Um, the number of, of citation, the, the attitude in citing is completely different. So you can use different metrics like the one we are providing through Scopus, so the source normalized impact per paper, the SNP, or the Shimago journal rank, the SJR. They are weighted uh, metrics you can use to compare journals from different, from different fields. And this is the journal comparator on Scopus. You can also compare journals and have the benchmark between journals considering side score with uh, our metric, the competitor uh, of the impact factor, SNP, number of documents, how many uh, articles are not cited at all, so with zero citations, and also the percentage between review and review articles. The last point, before to leave again uh, uh, the stage uh, to Anthony, is about research integrity and uh, Reproducibility uh, when publishing is becoming very, very an important topic, uh, and also very important for funders. Um, here we can, uh, we can provide a solution with Mendeley. I don't know if you are using Mendeley as reference manager here at the uh, Tel Aviv University, but Mendeley has also the data 
data sets you can see in the middle it's completely free and this is allowing you to upload your research data and receiving a DOI and with the DOI you can share your data you can uh, get cited by other people and you can share your data and be compliant also with some funders who are asking to publish uh, your research data or your data sets on repositories. So as you can see on Mendeley Data you can link your data to the, to the papers, uh, you can link to other softwares, you can get the DUI so you are citable and you can be cited by other researchers and you also have all the versions of your data set and you can get also the, pre the preservation of your research data uh, from, uh, from the platform. So as you can see a lot of different articles now are also including data and you can see here the link to, to data and to repositories with, uh, with data. Uh, why should I share my research data? It's, it's important because, you know, funders, if you think about Europe 2020, they ask to share all your data, so you have to be compliant if you want to be funded, but it's very important for you, for your visibility, to showcase your, uh, your research and of course it's very important for the community because they can duplicate, they can save time sometimes using your data and also for the society as well. Uh, hand. <laughs> I have my sit down. <laughs> too, too short? <laughs> it's not because of me. <laughs> All right, so back okay. to you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And back to you. Thank you. Great. You Good. Fine. There. And and fantastic. Thank you very much. Okay. Moving on. Okay. As I said at the beginning, we are squeezing two and a half hours into two hours, which is a pretty good trick, I'd say. Um, can I speak a bit louder? How about closer still? All right. Okay. We'll get this. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> <coughs> I'll try, I'll try to cough some way. All right, we good? Hear me at the back? You awake? Good, fine. All right, moving on. How do you write articles? It's obvious, not necessarily. Um, you look at Journal A, how do they structure their articles? They tell you how they want them. They don't tell you, then there's a default way to do it. If they do tell you, use their way. This is the, the, the general way, but always be guided by the journal. Um, so. The typical way of writing a research article is to structure it. It's got a picture of fish here. You might think, well, why fish? Why not? It's a picture. We think in pictures. We're humans. So, is there a link between the fish and the text? There is, actually. Because, now I've got to try and point and talk into the microphone. It's a challenge. Huh? Um, a <laughs> fish has a head, a body, and a tail. And your article has a head, a body, and a tail. There is a link. This is for research articles. Review is a bit different. Social sciences has got more discussion, less data. But basically, that's the structure, the logical line running through the, the actual article, which helps the reader understand what's going on. That's not how you write it. That's how you lay it out. If you were to write it, you get a blank piece of paper and start with a title. That's a heart's a slog. Think of it this way. This is your timeline. You start off with your figures and your tables, your data, your comfort zone. You, you write the method, you describe the method you use to get this. You share the results, you, you discuss those, you write your conclusion. Then you write your introduction. Then you write your title, abstracts, keywords. That is how you build the wall. Once you've built the wall, you deconstruct that into that. So, but that's easier, no surprises, uh, no brain fog, no writer's cramp, whatever. Just this is a way to uh, make it easier. If you do other ways, try this. If you don't like it, go back to your current way. I think you might find it's, it's easier. Now, using fish style, not wool style, let's just go through the various components. The title. Title is very important. has to be short, snappy. has to tell the reader what's going on. And it's a challenge because we're not used to doing that. Referees also do not comment often on your title. They see it as not theirs to 
to, to comment on. They should do, but they don't. So you're really on your own when it comes to the, the title. No, no help. Uh, have a working title and work on it. As you're going through, try and polish it. Various people do not think it's set in stone, just it's a working title. It should be the main topic of the, of the whole article, what it's about. It should be the first few words should be what it's all about because if you're doing a whole list, say from PubMed, you're skimming through it, you're looking at the, the first few words as you skim down and you want it to catch that person's attention. You want to hook the reader. So much so, they go from your title to your abstract to your article. That's the process. You've got to be honest, but you've got to be clear, but you've also got to be interesting. So that's a challenge. This accurate, specific, complete, and short, almost opposites. It's hard work. It gets easier the more you do. If you talk to any experienced researcher and say, hey, your earlier papers, what do you think of your, of your paper titles? Well, I could have done them better now. Of course, always that case. But always work on making it better. If you're not sure, check with a senior person. Hey, any suggestions for my title? Any ideas? <coughs> you want to somehow get people to, to be hooked. To find you, they'll use <laughs> keywords. Keywords are a few keywords which you put into your, underneath the abstract, typically, uh, and they'll use that in their favorite search engine to find you. If they find you with that, great. How do you make sure the keywords are right? Try your keywords in your favorite search engine. See what comes back. Are there articles similar to yours? Are there too many of them? Are there thousands and thousands and thousands? Maybe it's a question of trimming the keywords a bit or fine tuning. Have you found those keywords that PubMed comes up with eight articles? Well, perhaps it's a bit too narrow. So play around and see what comes. You want about 150, 200 articles in the last few years. That gives you a good idea. That is your uh, sanity check then. You look through those to see if it's your topic area. Do you know these articles? Are you citing them? Um, are they relevant to you? Because what will happen is if you use those keywords, they will go to the referee who put them in their favorite search engine, maybe yours, they'll get the same set of articles coming up and they'll see if you've covered the ones they think are important. If you haven't covered any of those, or haven't covered enough of those, they're thinking, what's wrong with this author team? Are they lazy or incompetent or what's going on here? Um, finding references to articles you find interesting is almost accidental process. Using keyword searching makes it a bit more structured. You might find articles you didn't know happened. It's very useful. So use your keywords as your sanity check to make sure you haven't missed anything out. The abstract is the next thing that happens. In the abstract, you tell people what you did. Here's what we did. Here's what we found. It's short, one paragraph, varies from journal to journal. If you can have the chance to put in bullet points, please do so. It helps the reader. If you've got a chance to put in a graphical abstract, please do so. Visual images are far stronger <coughs> than words, because we are human. We think in pictures rather than uh, in words. Hence, fish, wall, and so on. So it's an advert. You can see these abstracts everywhere. You don't have to be inside the IP address of the university. The referee is given your title and the abstract, and depending on the journal, also the author names and, and the affiliations, to decide whether they want to review your paper or not. So spend some time on the abstract. Don't sling it together at the end, because it really is important to get it right, because you want to interest the reader and interest the referee to say, yes, I'll look at that paper. It's hook. Sometimes you have the abstract and you, you read that and think, nah, not for me. So you were hooked by the title, went into the abstract, you realize it's, it's not for you, out you go again. That's fine. That's done its job. It saves you having to read the whole article, realize it wasn't for you. So very simple. Uh, here's what we did. Here's what we found. Very simple. Introduction is the next step using the FISH model, where it, what's happening What's important? Why is it relevant to the, the reader? Uh, are there problems out there? Are there solutions? Are they effective? Uh, are there things still needing to be done? What do you want to achieve? 
Well, you've written this after you wrote everything else about your article. So you should be able to make the match using the wall style, remember. With the introduction, it's not a history lesson. You're just painting a, it's an overview. So perhaps a recent review or two, a seminal paper or two, discussion about what's happening, short, snappy. It works. You don't mix it all up together because the things like the discussion and conclusions are all further down the paper. You're not going to say how amazing the paper is, no Nobel Prize material or so on. No, no, no. And only relevant references. References' job is twofold. One is to um, validate your work. It says, OK, um, I've done this work based on these people. So that's enough validation as to why you did the study. And also, it's to help people who don't know the field to find more out. So they, nowadays, all hypertext linked. They click, click, out they go. They read the, the abstract or the full article and come back and keep on going. So it's a way to brief readers who don't know quite enough. That's two purposes of the abstract, nothing else. They're only relevant references. If you don't have references that are, irre that are irrelevant, irrelevant, basically, extra ones, just fluff, it's not helpful because what happens is that that annoys ref uh, referees tremendously. With your method is a challenge because so many work, as Max was saying, can't be replicated that you've really got to be, be sure your method reflects the total protocol. Sometimes you tend to be a bit sloppy, uh, you, you cheat basically, oh, well, let's do a few lines. Can your method be reproduced? Can it be replicated by what you've described here? If it cannot, you wasted people's time, money, perhaps animals. Will they cite you? No way. Will they tell you what they think of you when they see you at a conference? Yes. If they're already replicating your work, they're interested in your work, they want to cite you. So please make sure. Think of the, the reader as a friend of yours who lives in Glasgow and you want them to repeat the work. Just be very, very clear. Here's how you do it. If the, if the journal is not helpful, not cooperative, and they say, you've got this much space and you need this much, you do a cut-down method here and you say the full method protocol can be found in a supplementary file. That's how you cover that. Referees are always nervous about the method because they love to look over your shoulder while you're doing stuff. They can't, so therefore they rely on how you describe the method. If it looks like it makes sense, it's well written, clearly laid out, then more than likely the results you're going to share have some value. And then your opinion of those, your discussion, is also maybe of value. If the method looks a bit shaky, any results you're sharing are dodgy in any conclusion irrelevant. So from that point of view, always take great care. You've got to think about the, uh, make sure that uh, vendors' names are mentioned, uh, any chemicals are mentioned, or purity, for example. Uh, the control experiment should be there. You always write in the past tense. Uh, some journals ask you to write in the active rather than the passive. You know, we did this as opposed to this was done. If you are short on space and of, of words, active uses less words than passive in your writing your manuscript. And the supplementary files are there for things that you don't want to put in the main body of the article, say extra figures um, or that huge, great, big um, Excel file that eight people in the world will love. Uh, put it down there if you really want to publish it. But the important thing is it has to be um, involved um, with the, next slide, has to be involved with what's actually going on in the supplementary files. Uh, the results are also interesting in that junior researchers share too much. Your skill as a researcher is to decide how little you can share. Not because you're being mean, but you're trying to save the onslaught of data from that, that poor reader. Because often the junior people say, well, we did all these experiments, here's what we found. No, no, no. It's, the skill is... This is the iceberg. This is what you're going to share with the reader. That's what you're not going to share with the reader. That's what it boils down to. You're sharing the main findings. It's all duplicate stuff or whatever. Um, make sure what you're sharing here, the methods you're sharing, match that, not something down here. It's important to match that also. 
Anything you find is a bit weird, a bit odd, that's okay. Great. Make sure it's not an artifact. Check it, double check it, triple check it, and put it to one side. That's, that's good. Make sure your stats are right. If you're not sure you've got the right stats package, these people in your department or university will help you pick the right stats package, or else it makes a, a mess out of your whole paper. When you're writing your results, try to use figures. Figure with a figure legend is far better. It's more memorable to the reader. They absorb the information easier than reading all your text. So if you've got a figure and a figure legend, you don't need to write that out. It's already there. So you've saved yourself some writing. You've saved the reader reading it. And the reader has got, gathered the data from your figure. So it's actually a win-win here. When you are using figures, again, 3D plot, 2D plot, very clear. Make sure that is in English, not something else. Um, the same thing with photographs, not other languages. Scale bar must be there. If you're using color, color is normally free online. Great. Be sensible with it, no flashing weird things. Uh, remember that 10% of males are red, green, colorblind. Um, and this is blue and pink. If you print it out in a black and white printer, it's gray and gray. So you're forcing the reader to print this out on a color printer. So put some stars on here, some squares there, just to make it easier for the reader. Think of the reader's needs. Um, this happens to be uh, pharmacology research or pharmaceutics. This says there's drug crystals there, if you can read that. So it could be for you in this area, you know exactly, you're woken up at 3 in the morning, oh, it's, it's drug crystals. Sure, help the reader. You could put it here, maybe, in the le legend, but this just helps tell the story. You're using your figures to tell the story. You're using your results in a minimalist way to tell the story. A logical line, here's the problem, here's what we did, here's what we found, here's what you think is going on. That's the logical line you want to have. Minimalist, but enough. This is the, a balance which you have to come to. It's a skill set you will develop for sure. You then discuss these things. It's a tough thing to do. You're not used to doing this if you're not published very much. If you're not careful, weak discussion, you've lost the paper. So always be very aware, not this implicitness, the explicit, here's what we found, here's what you think is going on. Very important. Be explicit in the value to, of your research to the science community. Do the results relate to the original question? I hope so, because you wrote the original question after you've written this, using a wall style of layout. Are you interpreting, interpreting all the results that you've shared? If you've got, say, eight results, you don't discuss six of them, you discuss eight, or chop two results out. Either way, they must mesh. It can't be uneven. Um, if you find things other people have not found, found different things, do you ignore that? Not at all. You, you say, other researchers have found different things. Citation, citation. However, we are sure we found this. It's not an artifact. And here's what you think is going on. It could be when other people read this and they check it out, they can repeat the experiment and find this thing. They might think it's something else going on. But they'll cite you because you found it for the first time. Are there limitations, perhaps? Is it that that particular cohort is no longer available? Or that cell line um, has been um, contaminated? Or even something entirely different? Uh, is that equipment no longer available? Or whatever. So if there are limitations, just mention it. And does that lead to a conclusion it should do, a logical process? You know, nothing weird and broader than the results sh show. And no new terms and ideas. That's, that's a very simple thing, really. But it's surprising how easy it is for new things to creep in. Uh, so you've got, you've got to be quite firm with yourself, not to make new things creep in there. The conclusions are what you think will be useful things to do. Here's how we can apply it out there in the world. Present tense, future tense. Here's some new experiments that need to be done. It's not going to be the last paper in the world, let's face it. Here's a few things that need to be done. We're already doing that one. You probably are. You're working on a series of experiments. So you're working on that one whilst you're actually writing that one up. So, so you're saying to the reader, hey, here's what needs, still needs to be done. We're doing this one. So patience, we'll publish. Or, you could, or in effect, you're saying, we're doing this one, so back off. It's ours. Picket fence around it. 
It's the same words, depends how the reader reads it. Or, we're doing this one, come join us. Same thing, depends on what their mindset is. So, always mention if you're doing your next experiment and you've already started it, you're already working on it, so they know it's coming and they might want to join you. We were surprised how many people contact you to ask for some sort of cooperation, some sort of collaboration because they come across your work, and they know you're working on something, and so are they. So between you, particularly useful, as Max was saying, if the international is somewhere else, you collaborate with them, you'll increase the average citations of your paper tremendously. You're not going to summarise the paper, that's the abstract's job. You're not going to say how amazing it is. That's the job for the people who cite you, not you. You've got to be <coughs> humble, 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 humble. References, make sure you get them right. Many publishing houses use reference checking software, many do not. So make sure you've got them right. If you can, use reference management software because every journal tends to have a slightly different style. So if you went to journal A and it doesn't quite make it and you've got to go to journal B, you just push a different button and out comes the references in a different sequence, different layout. So that's the, the idea. We happen to like Mendeley. We're biased. We've done it so nice, we bought it. Um, and we give it to free for people. Um, but uh, there's a nice comparison of reference management software here in Wikipedia. Uh, but the important thing is it's your responsibility to get it right, not ours. Uh, because you've written the paper, you've pulled it all together. The supplementary material, as I was saying, the things that you put down there that people might want to see. Referees. Sometimes look at this, sometimes don't assume they will. Um, some journals insist certain things are put there. So the Journal of Cell Biology insists that every original figure should be put into the supplementary file if you've made changes to the figure in any way. In other words, if you've, say, boosted it a bit in Photoshop, make it easier to read, they want the original there just to reassure the reader you haven't been a bit too optimistic, enthusiastic with the Photoshop controls. Um, or a whole bunch of other things could be in there too. But the important thing is it has to be linked to your research. It can't be somewhere to dump some results you found just so you can say to the world, I published those. The problem with supplementary material, supplementary data particularly, it's not easy to find. The data mining software currently is not very good at finding this. Once any publishing house. So that's why Mendeley Data or Data in Brief or similar is far better, easier for this uh, data mining software to find. Uh, when it's found, it also tends to be sort of publicized and so on. So you've got to be aware of that. It's nice to put it there, but it might be better to put it somewhere else like Mendeley Data. You then got to think about the cover letter. Do you do a cover letter? Of course you do. Would you send your CV in for a job, into, for a job uh, position without... Uh, uh, some covering letter? No, of course, you do the covering letter, and the CV is almost an afterthought. Well, in publishing, it's the paper and the cover letter. The cover letter's job is it goes to the editor, never gets published, never gets seen by the referees, never gets seen by the publishing house, it goes straight to the editor, who looks at it, and the editor has two jobs. One is to filter out the junk, which they get really fed up doing, but they have to and to look for great stuff. So looking for great stuff all the time. So you're basically going to say to them, hey, this is great stuff. You've got to explain why, of course, not just this is great stuff. It could be that it's uh, their journal, it's the right place to publish this sort of work because it's the place everyone goes to. Or there could be articles in there which said there's a problem with a certain method, you've got the solution. Whatever, whatever you want to do, you've got to mention this because it's very, very useful. How is your paper special? Everyone agreed it should go there. Here's why it's important as an article and for your journal. And here's some potential referees. One page maximum. If the software system you're using to submit asks you to have the referees separately, you can use this spot to have suggested non-referees. Uh, if you know, for example, there's that group in Christchurch, New Zealand, and that group in Toronto, Canada, working on the same area, you might want to say, well, editor, I'd rather they didn't see, these two groups didn't see my work till it's published. 
Because in theory, if they're sent to them, and it's a bit too close to their research area, they should decline as it's a conflict of interest. But you might want to be proactive here and just say, well, they're not these two. And most times, the editor-in-chief will listen to you and respect your wishes and not send it to one of those two groups. If you give the editor-in-chief a list of, say, this number of people who you shouldn't be sending the article to to review, they'll be so suspicious, they'll send it to a couple of those to find out why. Treat them nicely, they treat them nicely. Treat them like idiots, they will not like it. Reviewers. Will they use your review, reviewer? Maybe, maybe not. Do you ask permission of a referee to put their name on the list? Not at all. It's an anonymous peer review. Who do you choose? People you like, respect, people you've seen talk at a conference, people who really are, uh, whose opinion you'd like to have, people who will make your paper better. They're going to spend a few hours suggesting things that make your paper better. That's not bad, is it? How do you find them? Look in your first, if you're not sure who to have, introduction. Who are you citing? Seminal paper, a recent review or whatever. Useful. Uh, look at your reference list. Anyone there of interest? Did you, did you meet someone recently at a conference? You can say, oh, good person. And then you can list these various people. They shouldn't be, of course, people you've worked with in the last few years. They shouldn't be people who you know socially. It shouldn't be your uncle in Canada. It should be people who are actually useful, helpful. <coughs> Some journals ask you to do three to six. One of my journals asks for eight. Why eight? They have to ask eight people to have two to say yes, typically. So yeah, that's why they're asking this. Will they use your suggestions? Maybe. They might use their own two. But they'll look at what you suggested. Does this person know the field? Do they know who are good people? Mm, okay. They're evaluating you, the author, as a researcher. Do you know who to ask? When you are suggesting people, always use their official email address, not their Gmail, Hotmail, once it's free.com or whatever. Always, always, always. They might use one of yours, one of theirs, but one of, one of yours they'll look up first to see what they're like, use their Scopus profile. Often editors say to me, yeah, it's, I use it, it's useful because I look at the name and think, oh, yeah, of course, why didn't I think of that person? In other words, you're just, in effect, reminding them that they, this is a good person to, re to review your paper. So it's always worthwhile thinking about this. But remember, when you are listing these people, um, make sure they're still alive. <laughs> if it's a seminal paper a few years ago, maybe they're not around anymore. If it's your field, you should know if they're around or not. Let's check that out. Check that out. It's worth, worth doing, you know. It's happened before, I can tell you, sadly. And editors think, I know the person passed on. We published, you know, uh, we published a whole article about the person and their life. So why didn't that person know? Yeah, well, it happens. So you're almost there. Your article's gone through three, four, five, six, seven different proofs, typically. You put it aside, you come back to it, actually it's a bit... Interesting, it's a mess, so you polish it some more. Then, you then, this is the tough part, you ask your colleagues who are not linked to the paper what they think of it, or your supervisor. If it's multiple university, again, all of the supervisors, not just your one, and then see what they say. Then you have a little sort of conflag between all the co-authors. Yeah, right, okay. Here's all the various things they suggest. What are we going to do? What are we not going to do? Who's going to do that? Then you, then you actually do it all. Then you polish it some more. That's the point to send it in. Make sure all the co-authors approve. If you just make the changes yourself without everyone else knowing it and seeing it and they're unhappy, they can insist you withdraw the paper, fix it properly and put it back up again. And then you send it in for peer review. Most people think it's a black hole. It's not. It seems that way, I know. With us, it goes to the editor. It actually, it goes to us, it goes through a filter. It goes to someone who checks, is a conflict of interest statement in there? You said you're submitting four figures. Are there four figures there? Uh, they put it through the, the cross-check 
process, what's the percentage overlap, the plagiarism score? And with all that details, that takes about 20 minutes, the plagiarism checker. It goes across to the editor. The editor then looks at it. At that point, they say, can I understand it? Is the image good enough? No, reject. Is it within my journal scope? No, reject. A clinical trial with three patients? Forget it, reject. Um, is it, I can understand it. Is it the right field? Yes. Does it sound interesting? Yes. A couple of letters say it's interesting. Hmm, okay. Who should we assign? Which two people in the world should we assign it to? And they ask these two people, and one might say yes, one might say nothing, and then time out after two weeks, or might decline, and then the next person gets, shall we say, uh, promoted. And eventually, two will say yes. They've got, in life sciences, two or three weeks. In social sciences, typically five, six weeks, to do this review. And the review includes a recommendation. The recommendation is not a decision, it's a recommendation. It goes to the editor who collects them. Sometimes one comes in and the editor says, OK, that's in, uh, how about the other one? And sometimes she'll say, come on, come on, come on, you know, you've had a long time now. Um, I've got the other one in, you're holding up the process. And so they're waiting for that second one. What happens if there's opposites? There's, a, say, a, amazing, except that it is, it's awful, it's crap, reject it. It happens. You then either, as an editor, decide to send it out to two more people, or you send it out to perhaps uh, one of the editorial board members saying, uh, a tiebreaker, please. These are two people, opposites. Here's what they said. I like your opinion of what they said, and your opinion as you're the expert in the field. And you have one week. And editorial board members accept that challenge because it's a very useful thing to do. Uh, it doesn't happen very often, but it happens often enough. And then the decision is reject, accept as is, or revise. Accept as is, is unusual. <laughs> Anyone here had a paper accepted as is? Anyone? The reason I'm saying that is because it's a 1 in 200 chance. Isn't that amazing? So if you've had a paper accepted and you published less than 200 papers, that's why I asked who published more than so many papers earlier. One in 200 average. Amazing. If you're ahead of the curve, great. Till the next time, you get a rejection. That's a real bummer. But it happens. Even Nobel laureates get rejected. If it happens, when it happens, you get angry. You're allowed to get angry. A whole bunch of co-authors, oh, stupid journal, ridiculous referees. That referee B is useless. OK, five-minute rant, ten-minute rant. OK. Then you see what they said. Yeah, well, well, is it true? Is it reasonable? Also, read carefully what they said. Sometimes you blank over the word rejection. You don't read the rest. It might say, your paper is rejected unless you do this, 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 and this, and this. Oh, that's called a reject with hope. So that's important. Get the co-authors to read this. Get someone else to read it. Don't do it. Just read it straight away and decide. Just chill. Perhaps even overnight, chill. Then you talk to the various co-authors. If they do say very clearly, go away and die. Well, not quite. Go away, never come back again with this paper. You know, maybe Journal A doesn't want me. OK, fair enough. Then you work out between you what you're going to do. Who's going to fix this? Who's going to fix that? You all agree who's going to fix what, and then you start doing it. And then you read Journal B's Guide to Authors, and you restructure the paper in Journal B's style. And then you send it into Journal B. But you must use the referee's comments to restructure it, because the chance of that referee being Journal B referee is very high. Same keywords, same expertise. And if Journal A's referee had a whole bunch of suggestions. You didn't incorporate them and just send it to the general B. And she gets it. She's going to say, Dear General B, editor, I've seen this somewhere else. Don't say where, because they hate each other. Um, and none of my suggestions were covered. Nothing at all. Now, what's General B editor going to do? So always use those comments. Of course, the cover letter must say Journal B 
it happens too often. A tip, label the file, cover letter, journal, whatever it is. So when you come to upload it into the other journal, journal B, you think, <gasps> just in time you stop and you change it. The last thing you want is journal B editor to realize he's in the cascade. And journal A didn't like it, and they hate each other. Nah. They're human. Be aware of the sensitivities here. If it's a revision, OK, minor or major? Minor, goes back to the editor. Everything fixed, great. Reviewer, major revision? Mm. Have they satisfied your concerns? Yeah, OK. Sometimes it's a major revision followed by a minor revision, sometimes. They hope you can fix it, but they're not sure, basically, the major. Minor, do what they say, sort it out. Nine times out of ten, it's good. But not always, but nine times out of ten. It's not a guarantee, but it's pretty close. What you've got to do is what's called a point-by-point. Point. If you make all the changes and you say to the editor, hey, I made all the changes, thank you very much for all the comments, all taken on board, here it is, without saying what you've done, if the editor's feeling kind that day, she'll say, tell me what you've done. Line number by line number, color coded. If she's not feeling kind that day, gone. Always point by point. When we do our referee workshops, we always say maximum of 10 points. So say you've got referee A, 10 points maximum, referee B, 10 points. What happens if you have referee A, referee B saying different things? Opposites. That can happen. The editor in chief should have spotted this and said, hey, um, you've got two different comments here. You've got referee A.3, referee B.2. Use referee B's point because they're conflicting. If you do ever find this, you, you actually call it out to the editor. Excuse me, editor, you haven't checked properly. These two things are opposites. I can't do both. Which one? Normally they'll say, oops, this one. But they weren't paying attention. Do not try and do both because you can't. They're opposites. Easy. Again, it's just it's a simple error now and again. But again, see what they want you to do. They'll tell you normally in the letter that comes back with all the comments. It's not in the guide to authors. They'll tell you how you lay it out about color coding or line numbers or whatever. And then you do it appropriately. And then all the way through. If you didn't like what a referee said, and all the co-authors say, this is stupid, what an idiot. You do not write back to the editor saying, referee B is an idiot because number six point is ridiculous. That's not how it works. You do what's called a rebuttal. You say, uh, dear editor, we, no, referee B point six, we decline to change the manuscript on this point because we do not think it's correct. Perhaps that referee hasn't seen this recent literature reference. Um, and so we ask this to stay as it is. And you're a very polite, solid, convincing rebuttal. Now, the editor-in-chief can choose. Either goes with you, so, so your text stays in the record of science forever, or they go with the original referee. If they go with you, they'll send your rebuttal to that referee saying, hey, referee, just to let you know, it was a rebuttal. We're going with the authors. If they say, sorry, author, we agree with the referee, you've got a choice. You either swallow your pride and make that change, or you withdraw the paper Go somewhere else. Your choice, your paper. It's very important you realize that. Remember, it's always your paper. You have control over it. And when you've done all that line by line changing, make sure all the changing you've done is polished. If you have a nice polished first version, and then you make all the changes and you send it in without polishing it, it looks awful. It stands out. You can see it hasn't been polished. In theory, this is going to be your final, final, final attempt to make the paper amazing. Make sure it's so well polished, because that's the record of science forever. So spend time on doing it. So it's not rocket science, let's face it. Consistent, check and double check before submitting. <coughs> Clear logical story. Use referees' comments. That should mean you're in the 30% as opposed to the 70% that's rejected. That's the basic idea. Now, what leads to acceptance? 
whole bunch of things. You can read that yourself. You can read faster than I can read out loud. I'm assuming. So be critical, be ethical. Ethics in a minute. Uh, very briefly, open access, a little bit, just a few little slides of open access. Uh, open access is where the author or the institute or the funding body pays for the paper to be published and pays the article processing charge, APC. Uh, otherwise, it's called a subscription, or the library pays. 85% of the journals out there are subscription. And uh, you've got gold open access, which is either the article itself or just that, the whole journal. The whole journal is open access, it's gold open access, or it could be just that one article. And you get more downloads, for sure. I'm not sure about citations yet. The jury's still out. But certainly, uh, you get far more downloads because it's publicly available, easy to see, and so on. So it's copyright, the authors. So it's yours. You can decide what you want with it. Uh, and then you can just send it to the world. Uh, you've got different sorts of user licenses where you might have to, to choose, and they have different connotations and whatever. Lots of information online. Green Open Access is also called Open Archiving. After the embargo period, you put your accepted author manuscript as a, a word file uh, converted to a PDF on your uh, university page or your home page of university or whatever. So uh, that's basically a self-archiving. Why do you publish open access? Well, sometimes they expect it. If you're in genetics, for example, everyone expects you to publish open access. It's as simple as that. If you're in economics, no one expects you to. Uh, funding body mandate is often there. Um, so that's, that's the thing that's happening. And this was done a couple of years ago. If we do it in, say, two years' time, it might change a bit. We're getting more and more open access articles, but it's still there is this majority of, of papers published per year are still subscription. If you are going to publish gold open access, great. Look for good journals, none of these fake journals. Make sure your funding body institutions' policies, what they are, so you can reflect those. Uh, sometimes they say you've got to choose a particular license, uh, like a CCBY, for example. Uh, some licenses are different prices depending on the publishing house. A uh, CCBY could be a different price to a CCBY NCND. Uh, we don't charge a difference at the same price. Um, and then, of course, tell everyone, share the link, because it's, uh, it's free, it's open, it's your copyright. Lots of information here, Researcher Academy. It's an interesting experiment, open access. It's an experiment. It's only been going 25 years. Subscription publishing has been going more than 10 times that length, you know, 250 years. So, yeah, it's different. Um, we are actually doing some transformative agreements at the moment. That means where um, a university will pay some money for reading and also open access publishing, that combination. That's a, an experimentation going on. We know in a perfect world, everything should be open access. Currently, it's not. And that transition is going to be interesting because there must be 8, 10, 15 different ways to get there. So we'll try and work out the best way between all the various uh, stakeholders. Uh, promoting an article, of course, if it is open access, it's great. You can just send it out there. Hey, hey here's what I've been doing the last... Uh, couple of years or last year or so in your Facebook or LinkedIn or whatever. Uh, there's, of course, we do a whole bunch. All the various publishing houses send out information. Uh, but you can do things yourself with social media. Uh, when you go onto the Researcher Academy, you get a whole bunch of information uh, which helps you in publicizing yourself and your research, more to the point. Publication ethics is the tough bit. You can actually plagiarize someone else by mistake, and you've got to make sure you don't, because that can have some nasty consequences. When you are pulling information from other papers, and you're going to be citing them, you might think, that's a nice phrase, you put that in there, into your draft paper, and you might forget it's not your text. So always put speech marks around it if you're importing it, next to the reference, so that reference fine, you keep it in there. You either will keep the speech marks in 
or you will rewrite it in a style that reflects the rest of the style of the article, but still keep the reference there to, make, to reflect the intellectual property of that particular scientist. But if you've got several co-authors, several drafts floating around, it's very easy to forget which was which, what was your text and what was not your text. So speech marks is a good temporary way to make sure you don't actually plagiarise by accident, because that is uh, going nastily wrong. There's whole different ways of looking at ethics. You've got, of course, scientific misconduct, where people are just faking images and faking out results. You've got things like plagiarism, whereby you are copying someone else's work. Uh, you've got duplicate publication, which is self-plagiarism. Duplicate submission, I mentioned, where you send in multiple papers at once to multiple journals. Um, you've got to make sure that all the prior research, the references are there. All the co-authors should be there, no ghosts. And, of course, the conflict of interest statement should be very clear. Now, it used to be just a conflict of interest statement was sent in separately, parallel. Now that's sent in parallel in great detail, and it's also at the bottom of the article. That's a, a new thing that's sort of happening, and you've got to make sure that's there as well. This transparency is very, very important. Uh, if they found out later that you might have had shares in a company and you're reviewing their kit, they might think, why didn't they declare it? So, again, as transparent as you can, just because people can think, you just be honest with them. Plagiarism is interesting. Every other community in the world is taught plagiarism is okay. Even at school you're taught it. You know. Copy what the teacher puts on the board. Copy this out of the book. Go online, add a few sentences together into a little school project for the, for the school vacation. Cut and paste. It's seen as tolerable. And you come into research and suddenly it's not. Um, Plagiarism comes from the Latin word to kidnap. So just as society does not like kidnappers, scientists don't like plagiarists. And so you've got to be very, very careful you don't plagiarise. In some countries, if you are caught plagiarising, you lose your academic position. Uh, in some countries, they will ask for the grant money back they gave you to do the research, uh, which often you can't pay back, so you go bankrupt. So, yeah, so it's a tough thing. Typical publication, I mentioned, you, you publish it once. You can re repurpose the stuff if you need to. You can perhaps, you've got an article for biochemists, you can repurpose it for MDs by having the same data and you discuss it differently and say, we've already published this for biochemists, but here's a whole bunch of medical aspects which are more interesting perhaps for you guys. Um, and that's okay because you've been very transparent, you've cited your first article. All universities use turn it in to look at the thesis, if, how much overlap there is of what's out there. The company, Authenticate, takes this information, because they produce it for, for turn it in. They add in about 60 million articles of the, of the cross-ref database, and it becomes cross-check. And that authenticate is what's used by publishers to see if the articles being sent in have an overlap. There always is a natural level of self-plagiarism from your previous articles by a few percent because you like writing a certain way. Um, the score itself is not magic. It's just a particular number. If it's a certain high number, typically it's above 20%, uh, an editor will look at what the results are to see is it really random words, or is it really blocks of text, which will come somewhere which haven't been speech marked or haven't been cited properly. Um, so that's the sort of process. Uh, we used to check it at random. Now we check every single paper coming in because it's been such abuse in the past. Uh, it's a very expensive process, but it's something we have to do to make sure that it's good stuff coming in. Uh, this is an old article. Why? Because... It's been published. Nowadays, it'll just be a manuscript here. But this is an Elsevier journal, Elsevier Tree. And then this was published in 2004. And we were, someone complained about it about 2006. And we, we came across it. So we ran it through the, the, the cross-check process. And anything that's color-coded the same is the same words. This text is this text. This text is this text. That text is that text. 
that text is that text, that text is that text, and they found that somewhere else. So basically, this is a control C, control V paper. Cut, paste, cut, paste, cut, paste. In the days when a particular country was giving people a bonus every paper they published. They just made one up. And when it was found out in the past, it just went away again. It's sort of like if you had some plagiarism, it just disappeared, evaporated. National Library of Medicine said you can't do that. You've actually got to leave it up and tell people. Okay, fine. That's new rules. The new rules, we now put a, a watermark across it, and we say in the HTML, why? That's up forever. Forever. Hundreds of years. Uh, I've taken the names out here just because it's, it's a public workshop. But it's not the names out in Science Direct. So not good for perhaps collaborative agreements uh, with other people. With figure manipulation, you are allowed to do a bit to try and tell the story. You're trying to help the reader understand things. Again, like the Journal of Cell Biology, put the original unchanged figure in the supplementary file. You can change the brightness, contrast, color balance, nonlinear adjustments. You can't change, you can't enhance, obscure, move, and so on. This is pretty easy. That's how it works. This is a, a thumbs down one. It's old, but at the same time, this is fluorescent cell staining. Nothing special here. It's an interesting article was published uh, in the American Journal of Pathology. Someone, I won't call them a scientist, someone took that in Photoshop, wound up the colour. See? Different. Added a spot here, a spot there, a spot there. Flipped it upside down and published it as something entirely different. Another journal. So when that was found out, of course, retracted. So you will not see this figure anymore online without the retracted watermark across, across it. Uh, yeah. Why can't they just spend time doing an experiment? Crazy. It happens a lot. We have figure checking software out there. We've got more coming. We're trialing certain things. How about this? How good's your eye? Can you see these various things? These are all different conditions, different cells. Maybe not. <coughs> that and that are the same. That and that are the same. That and that are the same. You see? This is a fake paper. How about this? Some guy took a cell, a cell slice. Each paper, he rotated a bit. He was surprised he got found out before he'd boxed the compass. All the same figure. Terrible. And here we've got something just September this year. One of my journals. Liver, kidney, spleen, different sort of processes, different sorts of, uh, pro no, of uh, treatments. How can that be the same? It can't be. How can that be the same? It can't be. How can that be the same? It can't be. How can that be the same? It can't be. So we're discussing with the authors at the moment the wording they will agree to the retraction statement, which I'm giving to them. If they don't agree it, it gets retracted without their uh, approval. Simple as that. But this is straight fake. That's our job. We're the policemen, and we do this. Uh, it takes a tremendous amount of time, but it's protecting the record of science. That's what publishing houses have to do. We've signed up for this as our job. This is, uh, talks about the Researcher Academy here. There's a whole bunch of interesting information, uh, lots of stuff, uh, lots of information which uh, you can download as PDFs, as, uh, as uh, webinars, as podcasts, all sorts of things. Of course, University Library is very helpful. They've got lots of, of useful information. Go talk to them. If you find people that you know are on editorial boards or they're journal editors, great. It's a good resource for you. You don't go stalk them. You actually go and you, you ask them interesting questions. Can they help you? What do they think about perhaps your, your title of your manuscript or whatever? Useful things. They want to help, but, but don't badger them. They're not going to write the paper for you. Now, in a few days, like maybe tomorrow if we're lucky, there will be this whole slide set and some other stuff put up here. This code, you all get sent this. Everyone who signed up and didn't turn up will be sent this too. If you try now, you won't get 
the slide set, because under the system that Elsevier set up for some crazy reason, I can't upload the slides as a PDF until tomorrow. Because what day is the workshop? Today. You can't upload it till after today. As simple as that. So that's why, patience, please. So once you've got it, share it with everyone. Please, 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 please. People who couldn't be here, share it with them. I just want them to, be sh to, to get the information. What do we get out of it? This, this is the free workshop, by the way. We don't, we don't charge for this. We publish 18% of the world's papers. So if you write better papers, we'll get 18% of those. That's our prize. That's our win-win. Simple as that. Now, I hope that you've uh, um, found these two hours interesting. And I zipped through it a bit, I know. Uh, lots of information that you can find, of course, in the Researcher Academy. Uh, you can email me. Well, you can for the next three years. I'll retire in three years. Um, uh, or Max, of course. Um, and um, we have to be out of here in three minutes. Um, so I'm going to stop. If there's any burning questions, I'll ask them. Otherwise, we'll go outside and I'll answer any questions because the next group is coming in here. And I've already seen the lecturer looking three times, wondering why we haven't left yet. 